<laughs> All right, welcome everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for making it. Uh, my name is Sabrina Gordon. I'm the Modeling and Simulation Program Coordinator. We're very happy to welcome our guest speaker today, Danielle Frazier, from the UCF Veterans Academic Resource Center. Yes, we have one here. <laughs> it's new. You, you just opened in the last five years, right? Five years. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Frazier comes to us as a licensed, uh, excuse me, licensed practicing nurse and with a master's in clinical community psychology. Community psychology oh. pardon. Uh, she herself is a veteran, both from the Air Force and the Army, and we really look forward to everything you can share with us about the modeling and simulation program, veterans, and academics and workforce. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Thank you so much. As Sabrina said, my name is Danielle Frazier. I'm here from the um, UCF Veterans Academic Resource Center. Does anyone here actually know where we are? Okay, so two of my co-workers who work there and two other people. <laughs> That's a great start. So um, first and foremost, we're going to start off by talking about... And here we are. Um, we are located on East Plaza Drive. We are in the bottom of the CFE arena, directly across from the Barnes & Noble bookstore. So you could miss us, but hopefully you won't. We've just had a beautiful new facelift. We have the stars indicating each of the states. We now have our beautiful Pegasus and the DOD indicators, as well as the emblem of each branch of service. They are in the appropriate order from the year of their inception. Because um, if I had my way, they'd be in a different order. But um, we serve approximately 1,500 student veterans each semester. So that's usually a pretty large number for most people to think about. And we do only have a, a full-time staff of five people. We do also employ several OPS peer mentors, and we also have VA work-study students. They are paid for by, by the government, so we take as many as we can. Um, we provide certification, advising, career services, programming, tutoring, and quiet study rooms. We're basically designed to be a one-stop shop because with our location, of course, most people don't know where we are unless you've come into contact with us or been to some kind of training. And the other thing is we don't want our veterans tromping back and forth across campus. It's very frustrating when you've already made the trek all the way over to the bottom of the CFE arena and then you're sent back over to Millican Hall. It's hot. You're hangry. It's just not a good situation. So we really just want to provide all the services that we can right there. We do fall underneath the registrar's office, so we are able to function, um, provide the same functions they do as well. I want to talk about a little bit of the history of the GI Bill and leading into how that affects your programming here with the MNS. So in the beginning, the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, which is also known as the GI Bill of Rights. So what's a GI? GI stand for? It's government issue. So um, at the end, in the First World War, um, between 1914 and 1918, millions of veterans were just released back into the job market. They were giving a whopping $60, a train ticket home, and told to have a nice life. Now, Congress had passed a bonus law, but it wouldn't pay out until 20 years later. So this led to a huge altercation on uh, the mall in Washington, D.C., and because of the Great Depression, that was obviously a huge financial impact both to the veteran as well as the community. By the, second, by the time the Second World War came on, um, they had seen that the end was hopefully in the, in, coming to a close in the next year or two. And the fear was that the same thing would happen again. We'd have these millions of veterans, they'd be returning home, not have jobs, not have any kind of money and then this would create another problem. The other issue was that women had taken a lot of the jobs in the factories and as the disbursement of supplies and things that were needed for the war came to a close, those jobs were um, closing in fast as well. So the initial proposal uh, and the earliest discussions about the GI Bill were in 1942 and 1943 for a series of education and training programs because approximately 56% of the soldiers and returning airmen were concerned that there was going to be a Great Depression. So interestingly enough, the first draft of the GI Bill was written on a piece of stationery and a napkin at a hotel in Washington, D.C. by Harry Colmery, who is a former Legion National Commander and a former Republican National Chairman. So the first draft was issued in January 6th of 1944, but the problem was it was just so 
broad and so big, and there were so many things pending in Congress that very few people thought it would actually pass. So John Stell was heading the effort to pass a GI Bill of Rights, including provisions for the education and training. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So the House and Senate both unanimously passed the bill. But, of course, it got a little bit forward. It got stuck. One of the major problems was the conditions with unemployment benefits. And the other concern that, of course, Congress and uh, the upper government had was that they didn't want anyone having control of this. They wanted to control the money. They wanted to know where it was going. They wanted to make sure that they had some oversight. So the resolution was that the federal government would determine the veteran eligibility and the pay. The states would create state approving agencies that would determine at which schools the veterans could use their GI Bill money. Understandably, the government wants to know where its money is going, even though they like to spend like they have no constraints. Um, but they wanted to have some oversight as far as this went. In comes one of my favorite parts of the GI Bill story. So here we are, we're deadlocked, three to three. Representative John Gibson of Georgia had set a proxy. For whatever reason, they refused to allow the proxy to vote. So keep in mind, this is right after the Great Depression. There, you couldn't just call somebody up on the phone or send them a text message or you know, IM them and be like, hey, we need you to get back here now. So Representative Gibson was missing the vote. They wouldn't allow his proxy to vote, and they're like, go find him. We're not doing anything. We're not going anywhere. Nobody's doing anything until we find this man. So I find this absolutely fascinating that they were broadcasting over radio stations in Georgia. The state police were pulling cars over and saying, are you Representative Gibson? Because we couldn't just send a picture over the internet and put it on the news broadcast to be like, oh, okay, there he is, and he's driving a you know, Ford Mustang. So they finally track this poor man down, still don't really know where he is. Legend has it there's a couple different places. Keeping in mind that at that point in time, Representative Gibson had a horrible attendance rate. Now, of course, today missing 10% of the votes is no big deal, given our current uh, representation. But in those days, missing 10% of the vote was a really big deal. So needless to say, Representative Gibson only served six years in um, the legislation, but he was able, they chartered him a plane. They finally tracked him down at 11 o'clock at night, and the order was, we don't care how you get him here, but get him here now. So he uh, was able to get onto a flight. They flew him in. He arrived at about 2.30 the next day after they found him, and he was able to break the tie and make the vote. So this poor old guy here who had only, you know, had been missing a lot of votes, was out of the way, didn't want to be bothered with this, therefore leads to one of the most important pieces of legislation ever that affects everyone. We're going to talk about that later on. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt signs this into law on June 22nd, and that is a picture of him signing the actual GI Bill. So what did the bill achieve? Well, as we know, there was give and take about what was going to happen. So the first one was education and training. The second was a loan guarantee for a home, farm, or a business because, of course, back in those days, farming was a pretty decent-sized industry. Unemployment, the 5220 clause, saying that veterans, when you came back, if you did not have a job, you could collect unemployment for up to 52 weeks, $20 a week. But less than 20% used, used this benefit of unemployment, and we'll talk about those implications later. There was also job finding assistance, top priority for building materials for VA hospitals, and a military view of dishonorable discharge. So it shouldn't just automatically be assumed that a dishonorable discharge is necessarily dishonorable in some conditions. Because, as we've seen in current conditions, what if you are a soldier or an airman and you are stationed at a detention prison? and you're asked to carry out an unlawful order, and you refuse. So technically, you could get a dishonorable discharge for that, even though morally and in terms of the Geneva Convention, you're doing the appropriate thing. So this is why they wanted a review to see why were you discharged for dishonorable um, actions? Was there something else going on there? So keep in mind that the first three benefits were administered by the VA, which had only been created 14 years earlier in 1930. So the bill, the first one, in the beginning, it included two payments. You would get $500 per academic year for tuition and fees paid to the college and other institutions, up to $50 a month, housing allowance for single veterans, and a little bit more for 
married. And by 1948, the single veteran housing allowance was a whopping $75 per month. And the tuition and fee payment had been raised to $550. It doesn't sound like much, but let's think about the year. What was the monthly average cost of living in that time? $75. Okay. What was a year's tuition at Harvard that year? $580. So as you can see, it wasn't such a bad deal. Now, of course, in terms of today's compensation, obviously Harvard has uh, increased their tuition incrementally, um, but at that point in time, it wasn't that big of a deal. So the bill got passed. Everybody's going to college. Great idea. Everybody's on board, right? Wrong. There was a lot of controversy. First of all, college and university were a little alarmed about these people flooding into their college because the military wasn't as highly esteemed at that point in time. They didn't have room for them, and the schools thought, these guys are going to come back from a war. They're going to lose their minds. They're going to want to party. They're not going to be serious student. Um, they're not college material. What do they know? They know how to shoot guns. They know how to kill people, but they don't really know much about those kind of things. And at this point in time, mostly only well-to-do or scholarship recipients were attending college, and it was considered a privilege of the elite. And the public, scares, the public schools especially were like, oh boy, we're going to get flooded. This is going to get crazy. Now, my second favorite part of the GI Bill story is this fine young gentleman here. This is Don Balfour. And in 1944, he was an ex-corporal. He had just enrolled at George Washington University. He rolls up in there one day and says, hey, I'm a veteran. Do you have any programs for me? And they said, Mr. Balfour, as a matter of fact, yesterday we passed the GI Bill and you were the first person to ever go to college on the GI Bill just because he wandered in. There was no advertisement. There wasn't any recruiting efforts. He just rolled in the door and happened to become a part of history. So that's pretty exciting stuff if you ask me. So where does Florida come into here? Well, by 1906, Florida's two flagship schools, that would be uh, Florida State College in Tallahassee and the University of Florida in Lake City, they had both been chartered in 1851, and they had split into single gender schools, which was the U of University of Florida for men that had moved to Gainesville, and the Florida State College for women. Um, so thousands of veterans flooded the state's educational uh, institutions using the GI Bill, and primarily with the men, because the majority of men at that point in time um, were veterans. They were using their GI Bill, and so they just could not handle the overflow. So some of the men actually went to Florida State College for Women because there was nowhere else to send them, and they had the right to use their GI Bill. So in 1947, the Florida legislature resolved this problem by vastly expanding both schools, making them both co-ed again, and the Florida State College for Women became Florida State University. Right. So. so did the veterans do as expected and just pick the local public institution? No, of course not. They wanted to be different. And they always wanted to surprise the experts who feel that they knew them so well. So they decided, we're going to private institutions. You're going to pay the tuition, or we're going to have enough money to go here. We're going Ivy League. So they went to Duke, Stanford, Chicago, Southern California, Vanderbilt, those kind of places, and they turned out to be the best students there were because they were used to discipline, they were used to deadlines, they were used to time frames, they were used to getting the impossible done. So they enrolled to become teachers, doctors, engineers, CPA, and hundreds other professions. So according to most historians, the GI Bill is considered, along with the Social Security Act, to be one of the two most important pieces of legislation in the 20th century. So the GI Bill is actually credited with creating the modern middle class because when they returned and they had their money and they had their stipend and they were going to college and becoming educated, this is where the birth of the middle class arose from. So in the background here, this is actually one of um, the recruiting promotional materials. And it actually says on their next stop college, and they're all riding their little bicycles, and they're dressed in suit and ties, and they look all cute. Um, so for by 1947, that was the peak year of the GI Bill. Veterans accounted for 49% of college enrollment, which if you think about that, is huge. It's a really big deal. At a veteran population of 15 million at that time, 7.8 million trained on the GI Bill. So there were people in college, they were in other schools, they were in on-the-job training. And look at the numbers for farm training. I mean, that just shows you what a shift we have had in technology and careers and those kind of things. 
So at that point in time, they had to serve 90 days or more of active duty, have an other than dishonorable discharge, and they were entitled to one year benefits plus an amount of time equal to their time in service up to a maximum of 48 months. This program ended in 1956, and by that time, roughly 2.2 million vets had used the educational benefits. Now keep in mind, these are still veterans who had seen action. They had seen combat, they had been deployed, they had gone somewhere. 1952, we see some more changes going on. The Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act was signed into law by Harry Truman. The veteran had to serve 90 days or more of active duty. Now this is um, where things started to change a little bit. You still had to have the other than dishonorable. We see the stipend go up. And if you had dependents, of course, we now call that basic allowance for housing and dependents and those kind of things. So you were getting a little bit more. The veterans were now expected to pay their own tuition and fee as well as their living expenses. So this kind of makes sense if you think about it because I'm in the middle of this boom and I decide I'm setting up a college because the government's going to pay me. What do I need to start a college? I don't know. Nobody really knew. So if I said I'm starting a college and I'm going to enroll several hundred people and the government is paying me, who's overseeing this? Who's accrediting this? Who's doing something with this? Nobody. So my friend Joe Schmo could claim he's running a college and the government's paying for it and we didn't really have any way to substantiate it. So as a result of all kinds of crazy fraud and um, currently some schools are under investigation by the VA as we speak for not following the terms of accreditation and those kind of things, um, this is where this, this draws from. So this came, now we changed from a maximum of 48 months, we're dropping down to 36 months. So again, we're still seeing a huge amount, but the last payments under this particular program were made in 1965. In 1966, we have a Veterans Readjustment Act, and this was signed by Lyndon Johnson. This is a first bill for war and peacetime. So remember that I said before that you had to have been deployed, gone to combat, those kind of things in order to receive your veterans benefit. This is the first time that we're starting to include guardsmen, reservists, and people who hadn't actually gone anywhere. They were still serving stateside. So initially, only 25% of Vietnam veterans qualified for this. So you can imagine that was a pretty sore sticking spot for that. Monthly stipend of $100 per month, and then eventually by 1984, had raised up to about 376. So same kind of concept. We're looking at the 36 month time frame again. Um, Last payments under this program made in 1985. So, interesting point of contention. Did the GI Bill discriminate? So let's look at the statistics and let's look at who it serviced. 67,000 VA mortgages were issued. Fewer than 100 were owned by non-whites. By 1946, only one-fifth of the 100,000 blacks who had applied were registered in college. Historically, black college and university turned away 20,000 veterans. Couldn't handle them. They had no money to build more school. There was no place for them to go. The VA had strong ties with the American Legion and the VFW, which were primarily Caucasian. Banks and agencies were refusing loans. And the merchant marines also were not included. So. Um, when you kind of look at all of the material and everything that was going on in the promotions, you can kind of see where this is heading. So was the playing field necessarily equal for all veterans? You can draw your own conclusions. Here comes another key player. I love this guy. I think he's very awesome. This is Major General Retired Gillespie v. Sonny Montgomery, and he is responsible for most of the GI Bill that you might be familiar with, referred to as the Montgomery GI Bill. And this is due to our friend Sonny. Um, he had served in the United States Army during World War II and the Korean War, as well as the Mississippi National Guard, where he achieved the rank of Major General, Second Lieutenant during World War II. So you can see he climbed the chain pretty quickly. 
Um, he wanted to increase the quality of the recruits, and he was concerned with the lack of education because Sonny was looking at the stats for who had actually gone to high school. If you'll remember, when we first started you know, drafting people, it didn't necessarily have to be a high school graduate. You didn't even have to have a GED up until fairly recently. So there could be waivers to get you in. So Sonny was like, wow, we really need these people to you know, at least complete high school. We'd love for them to have a higher education. We need to do this. Now, one of the things I find really interesting about our friend Sonny Montgomery here is he was very pro-soldier, pro-airman, pro-military. However, he was one of the biggest opponents of the Agent Orange studies. And Sonny's big thing was, I need to see more studies. I need to see more studies. So he kept refusing the Vietnam vets, refusing that Agent Orange was actually a legitimate concern right up until 1991 when he stood behind President Bush and witnessed the signing of the Agent Orange legislation that then took care of our Vietnam veterans. So I think what I find so interesting about him is that he was such a staunch supporter of everything, but he really just fought that Agent Orange thing until the very last minute, until he really couldn't fight it anymore. At this point, um, he was the first congressman to lead the Pledge of Allegiance at the U.S. House every single morning, which I love that as a veteran. And he wanted soldiers to basically pay in $100 a month for their first 12 months of service. In exchange for that, they would get 36 months of GI Bill. Um, now, the post-9-11 GI Bill that we're currently operating under, for the most part, was originally sponsored by Senator Jim Webb of Virginia. Now, he was a combat Marine, and he wanted to pattern a new GI Bill after the World War II GI Bill. So, um, you see where we kind of keep switching back and forth, where they're trying one thing and they're like, oh, scrap that. Let's keep this part of it and move forward and build on that here. So, um, and basically Sonny's version of events was he wanted free educations for veterans at public institutions of higher learning. So, he became a, a great advocate for the veterans. Which leads us into today's um, veterans and their benefits. So we have Chapter 30, which is Sunny Montgomery's. We refer to that as the old Montgomery GI Bill. We have Chapter 31. This is for um, people who are using vocational rehab. Service members have to have a rating of 20% or more disability, according to the VA, and a veteran has to have a 10% more rating. With a Chapter 31, a vocational rehabilitation counselor is assigned. They approve the, the program of study, they approve the funding, and it goes through them. Chapter 33 is probably what we see the most of here at UCF in particular. Um, this is known as the post 9-11 bill, which the combat marine, Mr. Webb, had sponsored. We have chapter 35. Now, as we see the ebb and flow of war change, we see a lot of things happening. Vietnam veterans were not treated very well. We kind of learned and we moved on from there. So what, we're, what the government was trying to basically do now is we know that we have a lot of soldiers killed in action. A lot of them have a spouse at home. They have children at home. Now the family is going to be unsupported. This is where Chapter 35 comes in. This is the DEA, or the Survivors Independence Educational Assistance Program. And basically, if your service member is um, killed as a result of military action or 100% disabled as a result of military action, the dependent can use the benefit, this benefit, Chapter 35. We also have Chapter 1606 and 1607. There's very slight differences. They're both for National Guard and National Reserve soldiers. One has not been called to any kind of active duty. They just drill one weekend a month, two weeks out of the year. And the other ones have been called to federal duty, Title 12, for greater than 90 days. We also accept tuition assistance here at UCF that's handled by third-party billing. That's basically when a soldier is still on active duty and they can attend college. And we have EDD, which is Educational Dollars for Duty. That's a Florida state program. So sometimes these programs can be used hand in hand, as long as you're not double dipping. Double dipping comes in when you're using a federal program and a federal program, which you can't do. You can't use a state and a state, but you can use a state and a federal. So as you can see, this gets pretty convoluted. It's pretty confusing um, for the person using it. And one of the jobs that we do at the Bark is to guide people through that. So how does that affect your program? This is great, and this is fascinating, but how does this apply to you and your students here? So for bachelor, master, and PhD programs here in your program, 
everything is covered if they are Chapter 31 or Chapter 33. All these programs are already approved. Um, we have two certifying officials at our office. We have a lead certifying official who's actually here with us today, Bethany Glassbrenner. We have Lauren Sish Taylor, she's our academic and career advisor. So they work together and then we also have another certifying official who basically submits all of UCF's program to the VA and says, can we be accredited? Will you accept this program? What do we need to do in order for you to accept this program and be willing to pay for it? So that's one of the things that Lena does is she really goes to bat and gets these programs approved for us. So again, the certificate programs that you have here, because they fall under a graduate study program, they will also be paid for by the VA. Um, the certificate programs can also be covered as standalone because of this. And for chapter 31 and 33, this is one of the biggest issues that we have is the VA requires that if the student is to use their full benefit, so they want to have their tuition and fees paid and they want to get a monthly housing allowance, also known as VAH for those of you crusty old timers such as myself, um, if they want to receive both of those in full, they must be full time and they must have at least one face to face credit hour. Now here's where the discrepancy occurs. When UCF categorizes their classes as mixed mode, lecture capture, video, those kind of things, or reduced seat time, even if your student has to come to class once a week and can do alternative mode some other time, the VA does not consider that a face-to-face -face class for their purposes. So a lot of our students run into trouble with that, and so we, we have to try to work with the, the student individually and make recommendations, and that's where Lauren comes in and can kind of contact the department and say, hey, here's what we need, and this is what we can do. So there are sometimes ways around this, and we will offer that guidance um, to the student. Is the VA looking to change that? That's kind of crazy. They are having discussions about that, and that's basically what our students are saying, is they're saying, I still have to come to class once a week. What and difference is it? Very correct correct okay. so this has been an ongoing debate and I think as we see more shifting to that and away from the brick and mortar type traditional I suspect they're going to have to but at this point the requirement is one face-to-face -face credit hour not a class hour so if you <coughs> incorporate some kind of one credit hour class that is considered a face-to-face -face. and the way we determine this majority of the time is we look at the section number so if the section number is all numbers, we're good. It's a face-to-face -face class. If it is a mixture of letters and numbers, it is not going to be good according to the VA. So this becomes a very uncomfortable topic for us. And I would say the majority of students that call and scream at me, that's what they call and scream at me about. And I feel their pain because I'm also a student here at UCF and I have to follow the same guidelines. So it is frustrating, but we like the programs to know this because we don't want you to think we're just sitting over there like, nope. Nope, we don't like that when we're not doing that. Our hands are really tied by the VA. So again, um, that was a fantastic question. As time moves forward and technology advances, I suspect that they will work on changing that. Danielle? Yes, ma'am. What time frame do you think that would be? Is it, are we thinking it could happen in the next five years, or are we thinking farther out? I would hope in the next five years, but it's the government. And it's the VA. <laughs> so, it's a different world. It's it's completely counter, especially to graduate education. That's not the, the trend is the opposite. The trend is we concur. And especially in we concur, and especially for the non-traditional student, because in all honesty, most of the classes that we schedule here are not geared towards the non-traditional student. The majority are for the students who are younger, they're kind of coming here, they're on campus already, those kind of things. So it is a definite struggle. I was going to say, a lot of the programs, too, like business and those are going to online. Correct. So I've been listening to the arguments in the House about this, and it's not so clear. We feel like we're a big online institution, but there are thousands of institutions that are only face-to-face. -face. Correct. And that's where getting enough momentum from people writing letters to their congressmen and saying why you need things has such an impact. Right. Because really, on, online is not that big a deal in some states. Absolutely. Another thing to keep in mind when we're talking about the monthly housing allowance or the stipend, this is tax-free money. It was never meant for the student to sit home, hang out, and just take classes all day. It is a housing stipend, not I don't have to work at all 
So I'm just going to hang out and go to college. So again, that's another thing to emphasize the student is this is tax free money. And in most cases, we're talking about 14 to $1,700 a month tax free. So what is partial benefit? Then? So partial benefit would be, um, let's say that they're maybe taking um, here. Here's another thing. And we're going to um, I indicate this too. Here's another way the VA likes to confuse everyone and make life unhappy. Instead of just saying, if you're half time, you're half time, and that's 50%. No. Their rule in order to qualify for the monthly housing allowance is you have to be greater than half time. Now, how many college classes have you ever heard of, unless they have a lab, that are seven credits? Almost none, unless you're taking like biology, A and P, those kind of things that have a four credit. So you take like one three credit class and one four credit class. But to get to seven credits is almost impossible. So for grad, it would be. It would be 4.5, right. technically. And again, how do you take 4.5 credits? You don't, so it's five, right. And again, when it comes down to it, does it really matter if you're taking four or 4.5 in the grand scheme of things? No, but it's the VA. So these are the rules that we, and, and when I say, we give briefings to our incoming student veterans and we talk about you must be greater than half time. You know what they hear? Half time, half time, half time. <laughs> so we're always like greater than, and we make them sign a checklist that we reviewed this with them. So we do the best we can, but it's just like anything else. They have so much information coming out that at them, they're hearing, you know, what they want to hear at that point in time. So the GI Bill obviously is not perfect. <clears throat> Let's also talk about some of the issues that our students face when they want to come here to UCF and use their benefits. So we know that 28% of our veterans are still serving. They're in the National Guard. They're in the reserves. Um, they have a lot of issues with annual training because UCF's policy regarding military service is extremely vague. It is not concrete. It does not stay the professor must accommodate the student. We've had professors who are like, no, I don't care that you're going to annual training. That's your problem. No, actually, it's not the student veterans problem because if they decide not to show up, they can actually be thrown in jail or discharged from the military, all because they can't get an accommodation. Let me assure you, as a veteran and a former military member, annual training is not a good time. Some people get to go to good places like Hawaii and build houses. That's a pretty rare exception. Most of the time we're camping out in the woods, no shower, no real um, facilities, nothing. No food, nothing. It's like bare-boned camping adventure, only it's not fun and you're not really there with people you like. You're hot, you're sweaty, it's stressful, you're firing weapons. I mean, it's just constant go, 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 you get no sleep. And then you come back and your homework for the past two weeks is due in five minutes. So again, we want to be encouraging to these students of, we get that you're gonna be going to annual training and when the student lets you know, I have this coming up next month, that's the time where a professor can be like, okay, so I can give you these assignments up front, maybe you could turn this stuff in early, those kind of things. We certainly understand the VARC where a professor's like, well, I can't give you the test two days early because that's not fair to everyone else. We get that, but then again, common sense really needs to come into play. I mean, these people are going off to serve their country so that we have the freedom to do these kind of things. So there needs to be some kind of alternate arrangement if and when possible. How, I, nowadays, how often do the I guess, Florida National Guard know in advance the exact dates of when they're going to be on? That's a great question. A lot of that depends on the branch of service. Um, I have 13 student veterans that work for me. I would say 75% of them know a month or two in advance when they're going. The Marine Corps is the worst. They will give me a schedule and, and then my students will come in and be like, Miss Danielle, I'm really sorry, but they changed our drill to this weekend. They don't care. The Marines are the worst. They don't care. They're like, I don't care if you have class. I don't care. You're, you signed up for this. So you can see where the student is really torn. Like, I want to focus on my education, but if I don't go, I'm going to go to jail. So what do I do? And so that's where, you know, we, t we tell them, though, we're like, let your professors know in advance. If you have a copy of your drill schedule, and it will say right on the bottom of the schedule, dates are subject to change based on the needs of the military. But they should at least have something in writing saying that they're not just going to lollygag, hang out, those kind of things. And most of our soldiers and our sailors and our airmen aren't going to do that because, again, this is not fun for them. Their life goes on hold for two weeks. 
their wife or their husband is now pissed because they're not there helping with the kids and childcare and the dogs and errands and grocery shopping. And so it's, it's just another stress added to their life. Um, consider veteran cohorts. We know that veterans do better when they have strong support systems. Um, large public university with solid student veteran support systems are significant more, me, excuse me, significantly more likely than non-veterans to make it from freshman to sophomore year. 94% compared to 75. That's a big difference. So that's why we want our veterans get plugged into the VARC. We understand your needs. We understand what's going on. Um, if a professor is giving a student a hard time, I tell you, they better be careful because Lauren is not about to take no for an answer. She will sweet talk you till the cows come home and she gets what that student needs because we are very, you know, very much into advocating reasonably for our students. Now, to be perfectly frank, if our students come in and they're acting inappropriately, we're gonna have a conversation about that too and say, this is not how you talk to a professor. This is not the kind of email that you send. You're not doing yourself any favors. Let's talk about how to do this the proper way. So we don't expect our veterans to be coming in acting bratty and demanding and blah, blah. Like, no, that's not how we interact with civilians. There's a time and a place for everything. Um, we find that sometimes the professors aren't clear on their expectations. For a military member, they are used to every single part of their life being told what to do, how to do it, when to do it, how fast to do it, and how many steps it should involve. A very simple process to you is 17 steps and pages in a manual in the military. So when things are vague, our students don't do well. They're just like, wait, wait what? It's not that they can't think for themselves. They just are going to need some parameters and some guidelines for that. You also may find that your veteran students ask a lot of questions for clarifying. They're not trying to drive you crazy, I promise, but they just need some clarification. In their military mind, you can't just do something. It has to have a manual and 20 steps, and there's a way to go about it. So that's why they're going to ask clarification. That's why they're going to ask a lot of questions. That's why you're just going to be like, oh, my God, it doesn't matter. Just do it. And they like it's, it's a struggle for them. Um, confidence and assertion skills may be displayed differently, keeping in mind that there are different expectations for civilian expectations and military expectations. The expectation here for me as a woman employee at UCF is that I am kind, I am gentle, I am smiley, I dress pretty, those kind of things. When I go to a military unit, I cannot be any of those things or I will not be respected. The same happens for our male veterans as well. When you have to be in charge of 10 to 20 people's lives at a time, and if they've been in combat before with their soldiers, this is a really big deal for them. So the expectation they may come across gruff, abrupt, very businesslike, very, you know, choppity chop, let's get it done. So I have to be mindful of that as well and, and kind of switch, switch it on and off depending on where I'm at because, um, in order for me to accomplish certain things, I have to act with confidence and assertion and authority, and it needs to get done. So um, it, it can sometimes be a very delicate balance. And especially if our soldiers have been in command of troops all weekend, and they're coming back to class on Monday night, they're still in let's get it done mode and no time for chit chat. So um, keeping in mind those things. What does your program offer to veterans? What does the job physically entail? You have a beautiful website. I love all these amazing posters. These are great. We really need to get some of these for the VARC um, because this helps make the program real, especially when we're talking about you know, the metal program and we're talking about the combat medic playing cards and all these great things that apply to our veterans. This is why they're attracted to your program. If you just tell them it's modeling and simulation, they probably don't really know what that means. What does that mean to them? What is that? What do you actually do all day? So when we get awesome things like that and we say, oh, you know, we have a lot of um, combat medics who are going to nursing school and medical school, these are tools that they can use and the interactions with the mannequins and those kind of things. And I have an iRobot at my house. His name's Jarvis and I love him. Um, so this, this makes it real. It's not just a program anymore. It's I can be a part of that. Um, what does a job physically entail? We have a lot of veterans with disabilities. And we know in most cases, vocational rehab will pay for them to be rehabbed. Um, approximately 67 to 81% of the funds that are spent on uh, vocationally rehabbing veterans are a successful um, rehabilitation. So that means they're employed, they're marketable, things are going great. And we're gonna talk about tax incentives for that in just a few minutes. 
But again, is your promotional material veteran friendly? And again, relating it. What they did in the military, how is that transferable to your program? Do they already have skills that they don't even know that they have? Um, we hand out, when, when we have new student orientation, student veterans come to our office first. They spend two hours with us. We give them a brief overview of the program, run through the GI Bill, talk about programs. So this would be um, a great opportunity to maybe develop a brochure or a design or something um, tailored to our veterans that Lauren could put in with the orientation packets because we give them a huge packet of information and this is where we draw a lot of our veterans from. I'm going to talk to you about the benefits of bringing veterans into your program in just a few minutes. But before I do that, let's talk about um, employment needs. One of you had mentioned a little bit um, previously that Non-traditional students, the time constraints, it's really hard. A lot of our veterans are already working, and so they're trying to go to school and balance family life and those kind of things. So um, when you're trying to, to get them employed, we need to be aware of time commitments. And we also need to let them know military members follow a chain of command. And we also have the phrase, stay in your own lane. That means I do my job, I stay in my lane, you do your job, you stay in your lane. So when there's crossing of lanes, Veterans can get a little squirrely about that. Um, and they also need to know what is my chain of command. If I have a problem in my program, who do I go to? Because I don't want to just pick a name off your website. Who is veteran friendly? Who can link me up with the VARC? Who can help me resolve those issues? A great example, we have a student in a master's program who was dismissed from an internship. Claim to not know why. So Lauren gets involved, brings the student in, brings the matters to the student attention. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 that makes sense. And seeing it from um, this student is a former commanding officer. So it was a very big transition from civilian to military for this person. And so we needed to kind of have that branch. And that's where Lauren reaches out, partners with that department and says, you know, can we have a sit down? Let's work this out. And where do we go from here? So those are the kind of things um, that the veterans are looking for. They may not have realistic expectations when you're trying to put them in an internship or in a job site. Most of us veterans have handled literally millions and trillions of dollars worth of equipment. Um, I personally struggle with this because a few months ago I was given a project and I was like, no problem, this project is super easy. Well, everyone was like, oh, is this da da da? And I'm like, done, done, already done, done. And I, I just could not for life me understand why this was such a big deal because I'm like, I've handled records for 2,000 people before, like handling this little coordinating project that took me like a day and a half was not a big deal. But it just depends on your perspective and what you have done. So um, my director likes to tease me sometimes and say, you know, people are going to think I don't give you enough work to do. I'm like, no, I'm just super efficient. You need to emphasize that. So I create projects for myself. So you may find this with your veterans as well. Um, I go to an upper level undergrad class and I'm just like, oh my goodness, like wow. So again, your 20 year old veteran is different than your 20 year old frat brother or frat, you know, sorority sister or those kind of things. So two 20 year olds may be completely different. Um, internships are critical for our veterans. They need to be hands on. Um, they need to be face to face in order for the VA to help pay for that internship. And they may need to have the flexible hours that we've already talked about because they may already be working. They're probably going to need a little more autonomy. Um, again, I, as I said, I, I personally struggle with this because I'm just like, I don't need to be micromanaged or babysat. Like I've been in control of people and their lives and those kind of things. So again, it, it's the switching back and forth to make those roles match. Um, and what does a typical work day look like? So if someone was involved in an internship at your program, what does that look like? And are there accommodations for people with disabilities? Those are all considerations um, when working with veterans. So just briefly, um, there's more information available about this through the VA and through Voc Rehab. Um, but there's a lot of tax break and government incentives. We do know from studies that the majority of veterans, they love to be in federal positions. They love it. It's great. They understand it. They understand how the government works. And also, they can transfer their military service and combine their time towards retirement. So there's a lot of perks and things involved in that. There's special employer incentives. There's reimbursement for up to 50% of a veteran's salary. There's a Veterans Economic Communities Initiative offers network of support. And there's also work opportunity tax credits, which can benefit a company $1,200 up to $9,600 a year. 
So these are all considerations when you're looking at forming partnerships in the community with people who will offer internships or long-term jobs. Start talking money, their eyes are going to light up because it's good stuff. And who doesn't love a good tax break? So one of the, as we kind of start winding down here, let's talk about economic competitiveness. So the VA did this really awesome two-year study, and it, it, the results just came out last year. Um, so it's the Veteran Economic Opportunity Report. So we know that veterans using the GI Bill education, most of them are going to pursue their associate and bachelor degree as compared to certificate programs and graduate degrees. Why is that? So what degree do they start with? Either their associate or their bachelor. And so we talked about the current GI Bill. Most of them are only 36 to 48 months. So where are they using the money first? They're using them for that degree because then they're thinking, I can cash flow the master's or the certificate program. So don't be discouraged by that. Um, we do have some that think ahead and are like, no, I'm going to kind of alternate because they don't have to use their benefits all at once. They could use some now, then wait. So if they're going to med school or grad school and they know those plans in advance, some will save their benefits and say, you know, I'm going to I'm going to kind of hold on to my monthly stipend and those kind of things. On average, we do know that our veterans take longer to complete their certificates and degrees depending on than traditional students in a traditional program. Um, and that's basically versus students who graduate and go straight into the field. Only 8% of our veterans transfer their benefits, which is surprising because um, actually for those of us who certify the benefits and work with the veterans, we see a lot of dependents here at UCF. So we were pretty shocked that that, that is only 8% um, because veterans in mo a lot of cases are able to transfer their benefits. If they don't want to use them themselves, they can transfer it to one child. They can transfer it to a spouse. They can transfer it to the, all six of their kids and give them like a couple months here, a couple months there and those kind of things. Um, we also know that veterans using the 9-11, uh, post 9-11 GI Bill, they enroll in a full-time program six times more often. So let's talk about, let's step back to a couple of slides ago when we talked about benefits. So why would that be? Why are they enrolling full time? They want that money. They want the tuition and fees and they want that monthly housing allowance, that tax free money because they don't get as much if they're only part time. <clears throat> women veterans, I would strongly encourage you to start recruiting your women. We finish our degrees faster. We finish them more often. 10% um, higher completion rate compared to male veterans, 8% higher completion rate across all the individual age groups, and a 5% higher completion rate compared to a traditional female who is not a veteran. Um, completion rates of veterans using the GI Bill benefit and enrolling in school under age 30 are 7% higher than a traditional non-veteran student. And veterans under 25 constitute 58% of the post 9-11 GI Bill um, beneficiaries. So again, this would be a great place for when students are coming in for the bachelor to be thinking, getting them lined up to think about continuing on for that master or those graduate programs. So the most common areas of study are liberal arts and sciences, general studies and humanities. And most likely that's because we know they're going to go on. They're already thinking they're going on for a master's or they're going on for a PhD program. There is a rough correlation between the areas of study and the Department of Labor career projections, um, specifically in the healthcare profession. So most of your healthcare majors are going to come in for a healthcare major and they're going to keep working through that system. Um, such as myself, I'm a licensed practical nurse, but I'm working towards an RN, so I'm working towards um, my Bachelor of Nursing, even though I already have the Master's. Um, and some indications that degree re degrees requiring shorter periods of study are looked at more favorable by veterans. And again, that's where the benefits come into play, because if you know if you only have 36 or 48 months, you really want to make the most of that, and you want to try to take as many credits as you can to try and tap out those benefits. Those who enrolled under the age of 20 had the longest time to complete, which seems fairly reasonable, because you're still kind of floundering. Your employment situation probably is unstable at that point. And I would also encourage you to go after the over 50 crowd. Um, they had the shortest average time to complete their degrees, which was 2.4 years, because they're older, they're focused, they don't have time to go to school and be shenanigans, they just want to get there, get their education, get done, and get a job. So they're all about the business. So recruiting your female veterans is a good bargain, and recruiting your older vets, good bargain. So basically, in conclusion, what I've tried to talk about today is the history of the GI Bill and how forming partnerships with strong places on campus, such as your program, 
in conjunction with the VARC, as well as your community employers and internship locations, really it's a benefit to everyone here and leads to success for the student veteran, your program, the VARC. And I just leave you with a quote on the battlefield. The military pleads to leave no soldier behind. As a nation, let it be our pledge that when they return home, we leave no veteran behind. So. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Graduate program. We're also very good at <laughs> so very active, duty friendly. And um, our next talk in our seminar series is in a few weeks. We're going to have someone from computer science, Dr. Pam Wisnowski, talk about her work with uh, human computer interaction and security. Thank you. We appreciate that so much. Have a good day. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>